right, guys, what is up? Welcome to the 68th installment of the Plane to Win podcast. We're going to be uh, talking today with my good friend George Gammon about uh, what's up with the economy. And um, normally I get guys to do like an elevator pitch because I know that not everybody's totally familiar with, you know, my guests. Uh, but I think this, somebody dropped this in the chat before we got started. And this guy, Nathan, said, excited for the conversation. George whiteboard videos are more informative than any economics class I've taken by a country mile. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think I actually get that quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a pretty solid way to sort of like, um, you know, summarize George Gammon, but why don't you give him the quick elevator pitch and, you know, let him know who you are and how you got into what you're doing. Cause I mean, like your red pill, sorry, your channel, I noticed in the description, you know, in the about section, you use the word red pill when it comes to economics, which I thought was interesting. Cause I don't think I've seen too many guys use that before, but, um, yeah, let's let people know who you are and how you got there. Well, it's the same thing, Rich. It's, it's seeing the code in the matrix, right? I mean, you say that all the time and I'm obviously a huge fan of yours and a huge fan of Rolo's. And whenever you see that uh, or use that phrase, seeing the code in the matrix, it applies to economics and finance uh, just as much as it applies to uh, dealing with women and the, the sexual dynamics that you guys talk about all the time. But uh, the backstory is, uh, first and foremost, I've never taken an econ class in my life. Mm -hmm. I've never taken a finance class. I almost flunked out of high school. And I got, I got very poor grades, <laughs> to say the least. But uh, in 2012, I retired. Uh, I was an entrepreneur for many years and had some businesses that failed, like everyone else does, and had a couple that, that did all right. And the business I retired from had over uh, 100 employees. And uh, I, I had a little bit of money saved up, enough to where I didn't have to go back to work again as long as I could get maybe a 5% return. So I wanted to figure out how to invest uh, my own money. I didn't want to delegate that to someone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I didn't know anything about investing. I knew a lot about business. I knew how to make money. But that is a completely different skill set from investing. I didn't know what the bond market was. I didn't know what the Federal Reserve was. I mean, none, none of the just basics. Uh, so I started uh, watching YouTube videos oddly enough, and went to Milton Friedman, Free to Choose, and I started studying Thomas Sowell and Jim Rogers and Jim Grant, Jim Rickards, Peter Schiff, uh, Doug Casey, Rick Rule. Uh, and I, I, I really resonated with Jim Rogers. I said, okay, well, that's what I want to do. And this was 2012, so I wanted to buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. And so at the time, real estate was really cheap. So I kind of dove head first into the real estate game and bought a bunch of properties in Kansas City. And uh, then I started doing that in, in South America, in Ecuador and Colombia. And I've been investing in real estate in Medellin, Colombia since 2015. And then in 2019, I, I did a TV show down there, just one of these HG TV shows where they follow me around into the properties that we're remodeling and rehabbing and then renting out or selling. And uh, it, it went great. Uh, I was the executive producer. I was in the show. Uh, we did a season down there. And from season one to season two, we had a break. So I wanted to leverage the staff I had. And uh, so I started the YouTube channel. And I didn't think anyone would watch it, want to watch a video on economics, although that was my main passion. I love real estate, but my passion is economics and macro more specifically. So uh, the first few videos we did were on real estate. No one watched them. You know, you get like 10 views and nine of them are from your mom or your sister or something yeah. like that. <laughs> you, know how, you know how it goes when you start yeah, the crickets, channel. Man. It's crickets for the first. Yeah. The first bit. But then uh, I, I did a couple of videos on macro and those were the ones that really blew up. So it was a great fit and I just stuck with it. And after six or seven months, I had maybe 100,000 subscribers or so. And uh, now after a couple of years, we've got 300 and maybe 60 or 70,000 subscribers on the George Gammon channel. That's where I do most of the whiteboard videos. And then I just started the other channel called Rebel Capitalist, where I just do live, live streams on the daily news. And that's up to maybe a 60 or 65,000 subscribers. Now we've got the podcast, which is called the Rebel Capitalist Show. Uh, that's doing very well in the business and investing category in iTunes. So I just love doing it. I love talking to people like you and, and Peter Schiff. And fortunately, all those guys that I really looked up to and learned from, I've been able to actually interview for the show. So it, it's yeah, been a ride. I absolutely love it. And I just uh, wake up every morning and just super excited. Yeah, I've watched a few of them. I, I used to listen to Peter Schiff's podcast uh, probably around 2013. 
Mm. Um, he always had an interesting take. Um, yeah, I actually just got off the phone with him yeah. about 10 minutes ago. Uh, he called me up. He's in Connecticut, and he was talking to me about uh, some things he thought I should have added to one of my whiteboard videos. <laughs> oh. always, you should have said this. You should have said this. You should have said this. And then he wants to do a, <laughs> a debate with our good friend Brent Johnson on the dollar. So I'm going to set that up in the channel in the next couple of weeks. I get that all the time. People telling me that I should have included something in a, a yeah. video or, yeah. or a yeah. chapter in my book that I didn't. And it's like, well, okay. Um, you know what I was thinking about when you were kind of doing your elevator pitch is, um, you know, we kind of have a similar story because it was around 2012 that I started to get in the exit kind of space from my debt relief business. Uh, yeah. And I think we're the same age too, Rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't the housing market, um, you know, that I was looking into at the time because I was a little delayed until about 2015 and the full exit was around, you know, 2018 or so. But um, how, how would you compare running a company of 100 employees to trying to figure out the direction of the economy and where to place your bets with your own money, right? Like this is money that you've that you've earned, paid taxes on, and you want to deploy to, um, you know, go to work for you. What's that like trying to figure out the economy versus trying to figure out how to run a business? Like, how would you compare the two? Like, are there similarities? Or are there differences? Oh, complete opposites. You know, as, as a business, you know, you're, you're babysitting, especially when you got 100 employees and you're managing people. Uh, you're trying to uh, problem solve just constantly, constantly constantly putting out fires and then you're trying to uh, take charge and, and grow the business in whatever way that you can and try to seize opportunity um, but in investing number one you don't have to deal with employees and number two instead of having that offensive approach with investing you got to have a defensive approach first and foremost you know you've got to manage risk and the number one rule in investing is just make sure you stay in the game. And, uh, you know, Warren Buffett says uh, the top three things to remember in investing is don't lose money, don't lose money, and don't lose money. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, as an entrepreneur, you, you don't have that mindset. Uh, you have an abundance mindset. And uh, like I said earlier, you're always looking for opportunities to start a new business, to create a new revenue stream. And, and you've got to be willing to take an acceptable amount of risk and often risk that other people would see as excessive and in, in, in proper invest now speculation or speculating is, is different. I think there's a, a, a component of risk there that's acceptable, but if you're just investing and just trying to make a 10 or 12% return and uh, maintain your purchasing power first and foremost, You've got to be always focused on your downside, always focused on risk management instead of uh, an entrepreneur. You know, you're always trying to focus on the upside. And when it comes to putting money into the markets, wherever you deploy it, I mean, do you do you just sort of dollar cost average in throughout the months and years or do you look no. for buying opportunities when there's blood in the street? Yeah, the latter. Blood so the I, I've always but this is different, you know, based on objectives and your personality you've really got to know yourself well yeah. as an investor you got to know what your strengths are what your weaknesses are but you need to do that in uh, entrepreneurship as well but i really just don't i tried not to do anything you know going back to jim rogers one of his famous lines is he always said that you got to just wait and sit on your hands be very very patient and when a pile of money is sitting in the corner just go pick it up and then come back to your chair and in the interim do nothing and sometimes you go a year you go two years without seeing a pile of money show up in the corner but that's fine that's okay so many people have this itch to keep doing things and usually that's uh, counterproductive so as an example uh one of the first times i actually bought shares was back in 2013 uh, when Cyprus had the bail-ins, I don't know if you remember that when they're bank yeah. when they had their bank banking crisis, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually you know took depositors' money, and uh, their stock market went down by ninety nine percent, and uh, you could go in there and buy 
uh, publicly traded shares of uh, hotels, as an example. You know, Cy Cyprus is a big tourist destination. And, uh, you know, they were just trading for pennies and you could get like a 10, 15% uh, dividend yield. So I went and did that just to get advantage of uh, crisis investing, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never sold the shares. I, I still have them today. And then uh, another example in March of 2020, when the, the market was just in uh, you know, dire straits because of, uh, we'll call it the Cervasa sickness, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's fear, there's panic. Uh, that's another indicator I, I like to use when, uh, as far as on the buy side is when there's panic, you know, you always want to get greedy. And, uh, I was buying when oil was down under $20 a barrel. Uh, I was buying oil producers when oil was negative $38 a barrel. <laughs> if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was buying uranium. I was buying a lot of the commodities because, uh, at the time and, and to this day, I, I think that we've gone into, commodities super cycle uh, which usually usually lasts about uh, 10 to 15 years the last one started in 96 98 and ended in 2011 and I think that uh, we went into another one in 2020 and we'll probably be in this bull market super cycle until 2030 2035 now that's not to say that there isn't volatility uh, there's always extreme volatility where prices will go way, way up and then they'll come crashing down. Uh, but that's what you use as your buying opportunity and kind of buy around that long term view. But you got to be patient to add to your position. I think now's a great time or a great example. You know, we've got oil at $110 a barrel. And anytime oil gets over 80 or 85 adjusted for inflation, uh, it's it's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. So I was wanting to buy, and I did uh, quite extensively when it was under $30 a barrel. And uh, right now I'm not buying, definitely not selling, uh, but I'm waiting for a pullback. Uh, if Russia, hopefully, you know, the Russia-Ukraine thing comes to an end very quickly, I think that makes oil drop down to probably 80. That might be a buying opportunity. Or um, if we get a recession, you know, we had the inversion of the yield curve in the United States with the treasury market, the twos and tens, maybe two months ago. Uh, we had a negative GDP print for mm -hmm. uh, Q1 in the United States. Uh, we've got a lot of indicators that are screaming recession right now. So if we go into a recession, especially as the Fed is raising interest rates, that could be very bearish for commodities. But again, I think that's a buying opportunity if you've got that long-term 10 to 15-year time horizon where we're in this uh, super cycle. And you saw those stages and those fluctuations in price in the last one we went through from 96 to 2011 as well. So that, that's kind of uh, the, the way I like to do things. Uh, you know, another example of just buying cheap and selling expensive is uh, when I bought real estate in 2012, I wasn't trying to figure out the price. And this is something I learned from Jim Rogers as well, is I, I don't think that's a, a, a prudent strategy because, and that's what most people do uh, first and foremost, is they try to ask themselves, well, what's the price going to do, right? If, if I'm buying a home in 2012, do I think the prices are going to go up or do I think they're going to go down? If the prices are going to go down, then I'm going to hold off and not buy. If the price is going to go up, then I'm going to go ahead and buy now. And I don't think that's the right approach. Instead, you've got to just ask yourself a simple question. Is it cheap? If it's cheap, buy it, regardless of which direction you think the price is going. And if it's expensive, sell it. So in 2012, I thought the prices most likely were going to continue to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I bought anyway because it was cheap. And then I just sold my last property in the United States a couple months ago. Now, that's not because I think the market's going to crash. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Uh, but the market could go up another, it could triple from here, who knows. But I don't care about that because I'm just selling because it's expensive, regardless of which direction I think the price is gonna go. And I think if you continue to do that and you're agnostic as far as your, uh, the commodity, or excuse me, you're agnostic as far as the uh, types of, uh, assets you're willing to invest in and where you're willing to invest. You just do that over and over and over again. And I think that's an edge. And if you do that over the long term, I think you're going to come out a winner. What about the um, dollar cost average guys that are that are all about time in the market rather than timing the market? Because you basically summarized 
your strategy and timing the market. Um, have you considered that investment strategy? Yeah, I, I don't like that because I could show you so many examples of when the market goes down and doesn't come back up. Mm -hmm. So uh, now if you're buying cheap, then uh, it's just kind of a waiting game and you're minimizing your downside. But that's not to say that you get every investment right. Again, that's a numbers game. You know, you're going to get maybe 60% of them right, 40%, but you just got to ride your winners and you got to cut your losers short. But uh, as far as just blindly buying, regardless of whether things are expensive or cheap, uh, just because we've had a slight pullback, uh, again, I don't like that. If you look at Japan as an example, back in 1990, you know, their real estate market and their stock market went down by 50, 60%. And uh, to this day, in nominal terms, it has not, quote unquote, recovered. So, you know, the, it's a fallacy to think that the stock market just always goes up over time. You hear that from financial advisors mm -hmm. uh, that are, are young or are kind of trying to sell you some oceanfront property in Arizona by just showing you charts from 1981 to today's date. Why do they do that? Because we've been in a down cycle in interest rates. You know, interest rates have gone from 18 or 19 percent all the way down to zero percent. OK, well, in that environment, sure, <laughs> stocks are going to go up, but uh, interest rates are cyclical. So and they're usually run in 30 or 40 year cycles. So mm -hmm. what happens when we go into the next cycle of 30 or 40 years and interest rates go back up to 18 uh, percent? You cannot expect for stocks to continue to go up. And if you look at a chart of the stock market, the S&P, from the late uh, 1920s to about 1979 or 1980, and if you adjust for inflation, the stock market was flat. Mm. It was flat from 1927 to 1980. So it's just that, that you know, these last couple decades that people like to get hyper-focused on, and they say, well, if you would have do dollar cost average, well, sure, but you gotta look at all of the price action throughout history. You can't cherry pick uh, your time frame. And uh, that's, again, why I like uh, my strategy a little bit better when you're just buying things, when they're super cheap, when they're unloved. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really bullish on right now, maybe not at today's price, but over the long run, is coal. And, uh, you know, most people would be super excited about Facebook or uh, Tesla or something like that. Zoom, maybe, you know, some of these high-flying tech stocks. Mm -hmm. But when you mention coal, people just get this sour look on their face and they tell you that you're crazy. And usually when you get that response from people, it means you're going to make a lot of money. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they, because, you know, why do they do that, Rich? Because they focus on the demand side of the equation. They forget about the supply side. Yeah. Uh, one of the best stories I ever heard from Jim Rogers was uh, back in 2003, you know, he was talking about the last uh, bull market, the last super cycle in commodities. And one of his favorite commodities at the time was lead. And I'm, you know, you're my age. So I'm sure you remember back in those days in the late nineties, lead was public enemy number one. I mean, it was all in the media that it was getting in kids like bloodstreams and it was messing them up and poisoning them. And people were, you know, if it was in their paint, they were stripping off their paint and mm -hmm. redoing their house and all these things. I mean, no one wanted to touch lead quite literally. And uh, this was one of his favorite commodities and people were telling him they were crazy. But his bullish argument that sure, the demand side is going to go down, absolutely. But nobody is going to invest in companies that produce lead. Therefore, if there's no investment, they can't put any money towards increasing future supply. And mm -hmm. if there's no future supply that comes online, even if the, the demand is cut in half, the price is still gonna skyrocket. And if you look at a chart of lead from call it 2002 to 2008 or nine, that's exactly what it did. It went parabolic. So I think that we could be in that same cycle with coal right now, even though the price has run and I'm not a buyer uh, today. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, you're a car guy too. So I want to kind of like, you know, take a minute to talk about this as well. Cause I was watching this video video the other day. It's on Doug DeMiro's channel and he was talking about, oh, I love Doug. That's, that's one of my favorite channels. Yeah. The quirks and features guy. And yeah, um, yeah. 
yeah. Uh, I don't know what that is, man, but you know, just going around the car and like pointing stuff out is just, um, it's just a cool, you know, 20 minutes. And he's a great personality too. At the end he of the is, day, yeah. that's what these YouTube channels are all about. People yeah. just uh, bonding with your personality. Yeah. hundred percent. But, um, you know, speaking of the unloved and cars that would become future cl classics, one of the things that he was pointing out from past trends as well was certain vehicles that were unloved at the end of their product cycle. You know, a real good example would have been like the last model years of the, uh, first gen Acura NSX, which I think mm, went out right. of production in 2001, two or three or something like that. But nobody really liked them. It had no ability to compete with any of the exotic cars of its day. And they had a hard time getting rid of them. Same thing with the Ford GT back in 2004 to six, I think it was. They couldn't even get them off the lot. Uh, yeah. Same thing with the Lexus LFA. They were pay paying people to go around and you know show the car off at like cars and coffees to try to generate some interest so they could sell some. But all these cars are worth the worth a vast fortune today. Like you could have bought a Ford GT um, only a few 150 years ago. grand. I remember I was looking at one back yeah, in 2007 yeah. or so. Yeah, they're up over half a mil, you know, 600, seven, you know, depending on the quality and the spec of the car. Same thing with the Acura NSX. They're selling for way more than what they were selling them for, you know, back in the day. Um, you know, so he made a couple of interesting, you know, predictions and he was talking, you know, essentially about things that weren't loved today that are limited prediction, limited production, you know, performance cars um that will probably have a lot of interest you do the same thing i think with f-250 diesel trucks right yeah now. yeah I, I just stumbled across that and that's been a a really fun thing to do is kind of like a little side hustle i was down in tucson helping out my younger brother and uh i bought an airstream if you know what that is mm -hmm. and uh one of those you know silver cylinder kind of american iconic uh rv trailer things and I had never owned a truck. I didn't know the first thing about it. And so I bought a Ford F-150 and I was very close to Mexico. So I'm like, oh, I'll buy one that's beat up, take it down to Mexico, get it fixed up because I knew a bit of mm -hmm. Spanish and it'd be fun adventure. So I did that. And then I found out that the F-150 couldn't pull the trailer. So I had to sell it. I sold it in like three days, made like two or three grand. I'm like, well, this is fun. And I started to research these, uh, you know, these power strokes, seven, three diesels from 95 to 2002, a lot better. And I found that they're in massive demand. So I started buying them and selling them on eBay just as I was down there helping out my brother is a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. And I kept about, now I probably got five or six of them in storage, uh, that are like 60, 70,000 original miles on them. And I just keep them as a store of value, just like I'd keep, uh, a, a bar of gold, you know, uh, just kind of as insurance, because I know that they'll always maintain their value relative to inflation. Uh, you know, another thing that I wanted to point out, though, uh, Rich, what you're saying, those cars that are unloved. Remember when the Giardo first came out? Yeah. And I, I bought one back in, uh, I think they first came out in 2004, and I bought one in like 2006. But back then, the paddle shifters were really, you know, that was the, the hot thing, and no one wanted the, a stick shift. And then remember the the Ferrari, what was it? The four uh, the four thirty five was the last one that they had, or the F four thirty. I'm sorry, yeah, was the last one that they made with the stick. And actually, everyone... the last Ferrari they made with a stick was a California, believe it or not. Oh, did, I didn't know that. Yeah, apparently there's a handful of Californians out there with a manual transmission. I never knew. Oh, I never knew that. But yeah. but you know, remember back then that the paddle shifters were really yeah. the thing, and no one wanted the sticks. Yeah, I've heard stories about dealers calling like people on the waiting list for cars and saying, "Hey, you know, we got a manual transmission car in. I know we, you know, you want a e gear on order. You know, do yeah. you want this manual?" And they couldn't sell them. Like nobody would take them. Yeah, and now those sticks are are literally double the value. Yeah, uh, like if you go buy an F four thirty, you know, you get one for one hundred and thirty grand. If you can get a stick, it's like a quarter million dollars. Yeah, and I I would assume it's the same thing with the uh, Lamborghinis. I know it's definitely that way with the Murcielagos. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, there's only um, there's a guy with a YouTube channel, uh, Damon Fryer, Daily Driven Exotics. He had a uh, a gated manual Murcielago, and I think it was like one of six. Mm. in the world like, like that's even like that's rarer than a zonda bugatti like pretty much any other yeah. production car because most of them were uh eager you know transmissions yep. Yep. um i know that we're probably baffling some people on on the podcast <laughs> cars, but george might geek out on that um let, let's let's go back to um what's going on with the economy one of the more popular videos on your channel it's got it's got almost seven hundred thousand views on it and the title is the global elite's great reset agenda uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about um, 
and that video is about a year old, so maybe you can kind of like update some thoughts on that, you know, today on what you think's going on with guys like Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and the Great Reset. What sure. are your thoughts on that? Well, I actually just did a presentation on this at Mark Moss's event in, in Dallas, so it's kind of fresh on my mind. And I think, you know, to make a, a short story long here, you, you've got to start by going back to 1513, of the year. And this is when Machiavelli wrote his book called The Prince. And if any of your uh, viewers or listeners haven't read the book or at least watched like a documentary, you, you got to do it. Uh, the book's it's called it, The Prince? It, the Prince, yeah. It's only about 90 pages. Okay. And uh, basically, back then, uh, kind of the, the, the mainstream narrative, is, if you will, is that what made a good leader or a king or a prince was integrity, uh, was honesty, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, virtue, all of these things. And uh, Machiavelli was the first one that came out and said, you got, we're, you're lying to yourself. That what the way you stay in power as a politician is by doing the opposite of that. If you want to do good, you've got to be willing to be bad uh, ethically. You got to abandon all morals. You've got to be willing to go against your word. You've got to be ruthless. You have to do these things, or else you're a not even going to get into power, and b if you get there, you're not going to keep your position of power. So uh, you know, fast forward to the 1900s and several of the dictators uh, were very, very influenced by Machiavelli. A uh, Hitler, uh, Stalin, just to name a few. A uh, John Gotti used to reference uh, the prince all the time. Mm. And it had a massive impact on a gentleman by the name of Henry Kissinger. Uh, so much so that the one of the more recent versions of the prince, it's still in print today, um, the cover of it has Henry Kissinger on, on the cover. And so now we go to 1967 and uh, Klaus Schwab takes a class or a seminar from Kissinger at uh, Harvard. And he said that that was one of the had the, one of the greatest impacts on his life. And, uh, you know, Kissinger back then was saying things like one of his famous quotes, like, if you control the food, you control the people. If you control the energy, you control countries. If you control money, you control the world. And so then you've got Klaus saying that Kissinger was one of the biggest influences on his entire life. Now, we go back a little bit to the 1800s, and there's another gentleman there uh, by the name of Thomas Malthus. And so if you've ever heard the term Malthusian, uh, it started with Thomas Malthus. And he was the first one to really articulate this view where if the global population increased exponentially uh, that would lead to significant problems because we live in a world of limited resources and so he actually argued for uh, you know controlling the birth rate mm -hmm. put it mildly maybe even depopulating uh, he argued why war was a good thing because it would wipe out half the population and that that's better because now uh, we're not constrained by the, the or we're not we're temporarily uh, dodged a bullet as far as being constrained by the resources relative to the population. I mean, these are things that he would say out loud. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, since then, it's been very popular with the intellectual elite, right? So uh, you fast forward to 1968, there's a, a group that was set up called the Club of Rome. And they're basically just taking Malthus ideas and just kind of repackaging them for the modern age. And uh, Klaus Schwab was very, very moved and influenced by the Club of Rome as well, to the point where in 1972, he set up the World Economic Forum in 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called something different. But uh, in 72, he had the gentleman who set up the Club of Rome uh, to do a speech on his uh, most recent paper called Limits to Growth. And I'm sorry, the paper came out in 72. He did the speech at the World Economic Forum in 73. So limits to growth became kind of a worldwide phenomenon. And again, it was just regurgitating these ideas, these Malthusian ideas. And so much so that MIT actually turned it into a computer program where they projected the end of the world based mm -hmm. on human population growth, uh, pollution, and damage to the environment. Mm -hmm. And then in 91, the Club of Rome, which still exists today, I came out with another paper that was wildly popular 
that uh, kind of re-articulated their views, but then said the only solution is not at a local level. It's not at an individual level. It's not at a state level. It's not at a country level. The only way you're going to solve this is through central planning and basically a, a global government. And this echoed a lot of the thoughts from Henry Kissinger as well. So then when you, you fast forward to today, and uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of your viewers have seen the clips of Bill Gates uh, talking about how there's a big problem with the population going from 7 billion up to 9 billion or 12 billion. Mm -hmm. And this is just him looking at the Club of Rome and being influenced by Klaus Schwab. And this is just a Malthusian idea uh, that he also is taken to heart and uh, really thinks that, sure, okay, Malthus kind of got it wrong in the 1800s. We figured out some solutions there. And maybe the Club of Rome was early, but by 2050, this is definitely going to impact the world. So, you know, being a, a, a megalomaniac and these people thinking that they are superior genetically and intellectually to the other 7 billion people on earth, uh, they figure that if the, you know if they can't solve the problem, then we can't solve the problem collectively either. The free market cannot do this. So you've got two options. Either you reduce the energy use or you reduce the birth rate, or ideally you do both. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, when, when you look at everything that's happening in the world, whether it's the Great Reset Agenda, whether it's the government's response to, uh, we'll call it the Cerveza sickness, keep it YouTube friendly, Mm -hmm. uh, even right there, Trudeau, you know, Trudeau is just a pawn of, uh, of Klaus Schwab. I mean, in you, the, the way you know this is because when you hear Klaus Schwab speak and hear Trudeau speak, he uses the exact same words. It's like it's a script that they're yeah. given. And, uh, it's a dead giveaway. You, yeah, exactly. And Biden does the exact same thing. Yeah. So um, we go into this world where we are today, where uh, you're looking at what they're doing. And I would go so far as to say Russia as well. Uh, you look at that and uh, you look at this push towards wokeism as another thing. You know, and this is something that I've seen very, very few people connect the dots. And it's definitely applicable to your channel. You know, you talk about this all the time. But I think that one of the reasons the global elite and, you know, now they're in bed with the, the corporations as well. One of the reasons why they're pushing this woke agenda so much is because it reduces the birth rate. And if you just look at their three main objectives, and I've kind of done a lot of thinking on this, and I think you can really summarize it by saying, uh, you know, the reduction in energy, like we're saying, the reduction in the birth rate, and then usurping power, control, and wealth. So if you look at either a woke also, agenda also through softens that softens the population and, and it makes it more compliant too. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that, that the, their reaction to the Cerveza thing so was a, a, a big step forward for them to condition people to basically believing in absurdities. Um, and, you know, and, you know, yeah. you look at all the absurdities throughout the mainstream narrative right now, and the more you can get people to believe in what is just ridiculous, uh, the more power and control you have over their, their daily life. And, uh, you know, even looking at what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, you know, why is it that the media is just so hell bent on the U.S. getting involved with with Russia? You know, why isn't it something, uh, you know, like Afghanistan or why isn't it something uh, that where the media is not paying as much attention to it like they have in wars uh, in the past? And you say, oh, it's about, uh, you know, Putin invading a democratic society. Eh, OK, uh, I think if you look at the propaganda around this and, you know, we see it recently with this push towards Sweden and Finland uh, mm -hmm. joining NATO. And I think that it's because uh, the global elite want the United States to get involved because it helps them achieve those three objectives. You know, look at it through that lens. Is it going look what's happening in Europe right now? You know, they're having to ration natural gas. They're having to ration energy use. They're having to ration electricity. Okay, what's objective number one? Check that box. Mm -hmm. Okay, we go to, into a nuclear war. Okay, check box number two. Decreases the birth rate in the population, that's for sure. And then if we go into a war, you know, who are, are the, the entities that benefit from that? It would be the global elite, the politicians. The people are the ones, especially the poor and middle class, that always end up paying the price. So I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're behind everything 
Uh, but the title of my presentation at Mark's event was never let a crisis go to waste. Mm. And I think that they've got these objectives. And then when a crisis presents itself, they sit back and say, okay, we influence this politician, this corporate head, this CEO, you know, this hedge fund manager, these people that come to Davos. So, and this, you know, mainstream media outlet. So how can we, how can we position a narrative around this crisis and implement policy that'll help us achieve one, two, or all three of those objectives we just outlined? You're very articulate at presenting that uh, information without causing any issues on YouTube. I, I commend you for that. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I wanna ask you now, so now that you've sort of explained that, um, how are you hedging your bets to profit and survive that uh, economic and change in the world that you see coming? It goes right back to commodities. Because in that world where, uh, you know, one of their main things obviously is climate change. And uh, I'm not someone that's going to say that climate change is right or wrong or man-made or not man-made. You know, your audience can decide climate that for change. themselves. Let's just agree but, on that. Yeah. But, but I, can, uh, I can tell you that the global elite don't care about polar bears. Right. Uh, they don't care about the temperature in the ocean. It's all just a ruse. It's a Trojan horse to help them uh, achieve those uh, Malthusian objectives and the power control and wealth. And then we go back to the Kissinger quote, you know, how do you control countries? Well, you control the energy and how do you control the population? You control the food. And we can see that kind of play out with all the food shortages and energy prices going sky high. Um, and then with them again, controlling that narrative, which I think they're going to do more and more through this quote unquote disinformation mm -hmm. and this, all, uh, this basically war on freedom of speech and this push towards censorship. But that's, you know, kind of a completely separate topic. But if you look at, um, you know, how they're trying to get from A to B uh, with the Green New Deal, as an example, with mm -hmm. trying to completely uh, stop using fossil fuels, which goes right back to lead, remember, and the whole ESG movement. Well, why is it that, you know, why is, or one of the reasons I'll say, not the entire reason, but one of the main reasons why energy prices are so high today is because of the ESG movement because no capital went into sourcing more supply. So sure, you can sit there and say how dirty coal is. And sure, you can sit there and say how we shouldn't invest in natural gas. And then you can sleep well at night. You can look yourself in the mirror and pat yourself on the back thinking that you're doing good. Um, but at the end of the day, that's going to mean much, much, much higher prices and that's going to mean that the, the poor and the middle class suffer uh, to a greater degree. And that means lower GDP growth. And that means that the standard of living for society goes down because energy is the economy. If you looked at a, a chart, Rich, of the uh, global population, you'll see it just kind of exponential growth like that. Second. But if you, can, if you put that up against a chart with GDP, GDP does the same thing. But do that with energy use mm -hmm. and energy does the exact same thing. So if you don't have that energy increasing at the same rate, you cannot increase GDP and that's going to lower the standard of living. But my point there is everything that they're pushing as far as their narrative is going to lead to higher and higher commodity prices, not just with energy, coal, uh, uranium is another thing that I really, really like right now, mm -hmm. but it's also going to lead to the, the, the soft commodities increasing in price because unfortunately we're going to see massive shortages i look at what's happening in sri lanka right now you know their their, their government is completely imploding because they can't get diesel you know they, they just cannot get fuel because they don't have the dollars because for a variety of different reasons but i think that's going to get a lot better uh before or excuse me that's going to get a lot worse before it gets better so if you want an investment theme around the great reset agenda it would be buy commodities but may maybe not now you know wait till there's panic wait till the price really goes down and use that as a buying opportunity for this uh what i think will contribute to this long-term super cycle what are the commodities that you like the best you talked about uranium coal Is there yeah the two I those are the two i like the best coal and uranium and you like um, uranium for the purpose of nuclear power plants yeah because i think that's going to be their only option 
Uh, and, it, and you can really already see that their only option. Like I find it's funny when you see these like uh, guys that think that, you know, electric cars are the solution and they think that there's like <laughs> fields of windmills and solar panels that are that are collecting the electricity to charge up these cars. But they don't realize like probably 95 percent of the electricity comes from coal and whatever nuclear plants are still running. But I think there's a lot of people that are afraid of um, nuclear still, although you're right, it's it's really the only prudent source of uh, hardcore, reliable energy that's that's relatively cheap and safe, even though- Yeah, and uh, ironically enough, it's, it's a lot it's a lot greener than uh, something green. like natural gas or something that we've tried to replace it Biomass with. Biomass has been a big one that's been blowing up over the last few year, years, which is really just cutting down forests and burning the wood. Yeah, <laughs> biofuel. <laughs> they call it- yeah. They call you know, it biomass to make it sound environmentally friendly, but it's it's just you know tearing down trees and burning them. Yeah, yeah. one of the charts I've used to illustrate what we've been discussing uh, quite extensively is a chart of energy use broken down by the specific energy source, mm-hmm. going back to like 1800, and uh, it uh, that exponential, like we said. But you know, back in 1800, like the number one source, probably 99 percent of our fuel came from uh, biofuels, to, to your point. It was either lumber or, or dried cow dung, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we went to oil, petroleum. Then we go to coal, then natural gas, then uh, wind, solar, and, and nuclear. But what you'll notice is that we never use less of the prior energy source. So said another way, uh, today in 2022, we are using more biofuel than we did in the year 1800 yeah. when it was uh you know 100 percent pretty much of the energy we used we we don't use less of it we just use more and more and more which allows the economy to grow and allows the standard of living to increase so those people that say that we need to replace oil with solar you don't know what you're talking about we, we don't need to replace things we need to make sure that our energy sources continue to grow exponentially if we don't have that then what you're going to have is just uh, you're going to kill billions of people on earth and you're going to lower the standard of living for everyone else. And it's, it's going to get really ugly, really quick. If, if you, if you flatten out the energy source, but yet keep the uh, population growing exponentially, they've got the, you know, that's one thing I'll give them credit for like Bill Gates and Klaus, they've got the problem. Correct. It's mm-hmm. just their solution is wildly, wildly wrong. You know, mm-hmm. Uh, our, my solution would be let the free market fix this. It's been fixing it since Malthus came out with his ideas in 1800. Because if the population goes from 7 billion to 9 billion, what Bill Gates forgets to tell you is that's an, an additional 2 billion people on this planet that can solve the problem. And if you just deregulate, if you just let the people, uh, you know, just do what they do and, and pursue their own self-interest, uh, going back to Atlas Shrugged, uh, you're going to solve these Malthusian problems, uh, but it's not going to come from a top-down approach. It's got to be from a decentralized, bottom-up, free market capitalist approach. Yeah, but you're, I mean, you're asking these elites to step aside and let the markets do their thing, and they don't like doing that. Yeah, yeah. They're always going to well, try to meddle. It, it, it um, crushes their worldview because their yeah. worldview is based pretty much in eugenics with this idea that they are... Uh, superior yeah, in pretty much problems. every way so if they can't solve the problem there's no way they can expect anyone else to solve the problem because everyone else is inferior to them yeah and, it, and i think it all you know is predicated on breeding fear whether it's you know fear around the environment climate change of food you know viruses um it, look at what they're one. doing to the free-range chickens in yeah. in uh the united have you read into that i mean that is very disturbing they're, yeah. they're killing them by the millions because they're saying that they're scared of another, you know, bird flu. And that it's like, really, well, yeah, are, are we really scared of that? Recently. Or are you just trying to make sure people can't pox? feed themselves? I don't know if you heard about the new one that just came out. It's called the monkey pox. Uh, I, I heard about that this morning somewhere. Yeah, uh, that's that's you guys are going to be hearing a lot about that over the next few weeks because uh, the whole uh, cerveza sickness has uh, played itself out, and you know people aren't 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 really buying it anymore, so they have to cook up a new one. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. Um, back to the commodities with coal and uranium. Are there any companies that you like? I have my pen ready, so I can jot down and add it to my watch list. 
<laughs> no, you know, I, I need to get back on that bandwagon. I've been so busy that back in um, March of 2020, I I was I wanted to buy these things. So I bought just the ETFs because I didn't have time to research it. So I bought yeah. URA, which is an ETF for uranium. Uh, and I bought the coal ETF, which at the time was KOL. And it was paying like some outrageous dividend yield, like 15%. So mm. uh, with coal, what happened is it, it like tripled or quadrupled in price. But for some reason, uh, it was so unpopular that uh, they they um, they stopped it. They, they just uh, discontinued the ETF. And that's a great contrarian indicator in and of itself right mm. there. Um, but now I'm looking for some other coal plays when... Uh, they come down, but I don't have any specific ones. Uh, I would look at producers, um, maybe in the United States, but uh, I hate to say Australia. Usually those are the ones that pay the great dividends, but I think people just have to do some homework there. Um, also, if you want to, if you guys want to follow Chris McIntosh on Twitter, uh, he's at Capitalist Exploits, I believe is his handle. Uh, he's one of the people I partner with in Rebel Capitalist Pro, mm -hmm. and he's been a hedge fund manager for over 20 years and he is really neck deep in the commodity space especially with coal and uranium and uh you know he has a lot of those specific companies that he suggests as far as uranium though i can give you a good one there hmm. and that would just be the sprott uh uranium trust and what's interesting is usually if you want to go long uranium you've got to go through a producer but you're taking on additional risk there because you've got a management team you've got a capital structure uh you've got uh you know you've got the the risk of whatever country the uranium producer maybe they nationalize the mine who knows what happens mm. so you've got government risk there as well but if you can actually buy the commodity itself then you eliminate all that risk that's the pure play Mm. You go long uranium prior to sprott setting up this trust that wasn't possible but now uh it is you just buy shares of their trust and what they do is they actually buy the physical uranium and they store it so and, you don't have to store a radioactive product in your yeah in your garage radio. next to your mclaren 720. <laughs> <laughs> so i would look at sprott uh uranium right. trust yeah good good tip so sam's asking a question he says george what are your thoughts on teespring and Redbubble? i'm not sure what's going on with those two do you know about that no, I don't know what those are. Teespring's the uh, company that YouTube bought that I, they actually do my merch, so my mugs and my T-shirts and, and stuff oh, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's who Teespring is, but I've never heard of Redbubble. No? I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. It's it's for me, I, I don't really get into that stuff too much because it always seems like angel investing. Okay. Like, I get those questions all the time. It's like, what do you think of XYZ company that doesn't have any revenues that doesn't, yeah. or maybe have revenue, but doesn't have a lot of profit? You know, yeah. their upside is this, 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 and this. And I say, yeah, it, it is. But again, you're angel investing, and I don't like to do that. I always say, Rich, that I like to buy a dollar for 50 cents. I don't mm -hmm. like to buy a dollar for $5, hoping it goes to $10. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's in human nature, especially for like first time investors. And I've made this, you know, mistake. I remember back in the day, uh, I can't remember when it was, but there was this diamond mine that was like, oh, this is going to be the next whatever, right? And yeah, I don't like that stuff. Tahara, uh, T-A-H, I'll never forget the symbol, but I, you know, I piled in a, a few thousand dollars that I had sitting around is basically all that I had. I'm like, oh yeah, this will turn into a million. I'll use this to buy my, you know, wealth and sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it all went to zero, you know, of course. So like, you know, whenever you see these like penny offerings or these small opportunities, it's like whenever somebody comes at me with these, what do you think of this chain and that chain on, you know, the blockchain sort of thing? And it's like, I did a cast about this, you know, the other day. And if you guys haven't watched it, you should definitely go back and watch the last plane to win from the prior week. But there's 19,500 cryptocurrencies and most of them are all going to go to zero in the next few years. Um, they don't have much of a use case. So, I mean, if you want to roll the dice and you think that, you know, investing in something that is that speculative is is going to make you wealthy. I uh, I wish you luck. Um, you yeah, know, that's just my take on it. Though I always like as an entrepreneur, it was just always my nature to where I would rather buy a McDonald's than invest that million dollars in some sort of startup hmm. uh, that didn't have any revenue or profit but had just massive upside. Uh, yeah. I'll take the the, the McDonald's the sure every yeah. day of the week. Yeah. 
definitely sure thing. Uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro says, George, do you foresee China becoming the largest economy and controlling energy, birth rate, and money? Probably not energy unless they partner up with Russia. And I think that's... They don't have uh, a lot in the way of resources, do they? Natural resources? No, well, not enough for 1.5 billion people. Yeah. You know, they've got a lot of resources, but that that's a, a huge population that you have to feed uh, first and foremost. And so I think that's why they'll continue to be cozy with Russia. And that's another reason why I don't think it's a good idea for the United States to push the envelope there because we are heavily dependent on uh, China for most of the goods that we have in the United States. Mm -hmm. But that's a completely uh, you know separate topic. The birth rate, I mean, they're trying to increase the birth rate right now. As far as energy, I think they're going to try to delegate that or offload that to their partnership with Russia. I mean, right now, all the oil that uh, Europe is not buying or the nat gas that Europe is not buying, uh, China is buying at 50 cents on the dollar. So, you know, I you, think the, I read somewhere today that they're that they're building up uh, a strategic reserves at this point, it, as they should. Right. I mean, as they should, that that's the smart thing to do, especially when you're long dollars and you're short energy. That That's what that's a kind of a macro nerdy way of saying it. That just means that you've got a lot of dollar cash flow coming in because you export so much to the United States and those exports are settled in dollars. But what you don't have a lot of is energy. So you need those dollars to buy the energy because global energy is also uh, settled in dollars. But that's why this relationship with China, or excuse me, with Russia, I think is so important to them. And that's why it's hugely beneficial. The, our, the West's approach to these sanctions is so beneficial to China is because, again, they're getting that energy that they so desperately need on the cheap. And they're mm -hmm. storing it and they're saving it for a rainy day. I think that's maybe what might explain this what seems to be irrational approach toward the cerveza sickness with these crazy lockdowns uh, that they've had in areas like Shanghai. It seems like they may be trying to condition their society to get acclimated to living with less food and less energy if they have to cut off uh, the dollar supply coming in from the United States. As far as money, yeah, I mean, they come out with a digital yuan. And I think that they are going to try to uh, push their central bank digital currency. And I think one of the, the uh, ways that they'll get mass adoption is through the One Belt, uh, One Road initiative. So they've made all these investments in, across uh, India, across uh, Eastern Europe, and in Africa and South America. We've all heard of this. And I think that uh, if they come out with a digital yuan, that is the, uh, you know, all currency is a liability of a bank, whether it's a central bank or a commercial bank. And the big difference there is a commercial bank has a PL, so they have to be very selective about who they lend to. But a central bank doesn't really have a PL. They do, but they can just print money. You know, they, they don't really have to have positive equity. They can have negative equity. They can't go out of business, right? They can't go bust. So uh, they can issue loans if these other countries have accounts and these main corporations in other countries have accounts with the PBOC, which is their central bank. You know, they can really determine who's getting credit, who's not getting credit, and they don't really have to worry about that PL. And once the big corporations in these countries start using the digital yuan, then so will the consumers. And then you just kind of try to create this network effect. So that's not a prediction. Uh, but it, it is to say that I think this is one of their main objectives over the next five, uh, ten years is to take control of money through the digital yu yuan. And they're creating that network through the One Belt, One Road initiative. Um, speaking of China, um, there's a real chink in the armor. Like there's a there, like this is the Achilles heel that I see. That's a real problem for the economy and for stability in the world, because China's made it clear they want Taiwan. Mm. And I think it's something like 95% of chip uh, production happens in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan doesn't want to be a part of China. Um, yeah. Most of these companies, most of these high tech companies have well established businesses and production facilities that are really high tech that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And if you want like military grade chips, um, 
for things like computers, for military equipment, for anything that's high tech. Uh, I'm, I'm sure things like Tesla's Apple phones and all these things as well. That's where it comes from. And yeah. that's going to mean that if China goes for Taiwan, the USA has to get involved, right? They can't hand over access to that technology and those production facilities to China. That's going to be a real pro problem. I don't know how much you know about the details of that, but it's but it's a pretty significant risk as, as I see it. Do you have any comments on that? I thought that there was a decent probability that China would go after Taiwan right when Russia went into Ukraine. I thought so too. Yeah, I, I yeah. thought that let's let's watch Taiwan here. Fortunately, that that didn't happen because no, I don't no, no. want things to escalate. And I mean, the but, other problem that China has too is they actually have a very short timeline. Like they legitimately have to do this within the next five years. Otherwise, they won't have the resources and manpower to take back Taiwan. Yeah, well, that that's they, they may, though, because the, if you look at China's demographics, it is true that they've got a big problem there, just like mm -hmm. Japan. Maybe not to the extent that Japan has it, but they've got a big problem there where they've got a lot more old people uh, than they have young people coming up to replace them. But if they are able to continue to urbanize and grow their economy, you're pulling so many poor people out of poverty into the cities that you you, you might not have as big a demographic problem mm -hmm. as uh, other countries that didn't have that growth potential. And I'm not talking about the next year or two, you know, China's gonna have big, big problems. But I'm talking about maybe five, 10 years down the road. Another thing I, I did on a video the other day, is I, I did some research on their uh, their population and ages, and they actually have more people in China that are under the age of 20 mm -hmm. uh, than we have total in the United States. So it, it is true if you take all 1.5 billion and look at it in an aggregate total that they've got a problem there. But if you look at sections and if you look at the economy transitioning from poor uh, manufacturing to kind of middle class consumerism, they they could potentially uh, dodge a bullet. Interesting. Uh, got another super chat here. Pedro says, uh, George, do you foresee the SEC delisting Chinese companies from the New York Stock Exchange? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I don't know that that's going to happen. I wouldn't predict that. But uh, look at what they, they did with the Russian Russia. ADRs. You know, yeah. I mean, most people don't realize this, but the like Luke Oil and Spurbank which is the biggest bank in Russia, and that's their main oil company, uh, they're still trading on the Russian stock exchange. You know, Back about when Russia first went in, uh, they closed down their stock exchange. Um, and everyone thinks that it's still closed today because the ADRs that, that you could buy as an American or a Canadian citizen, that really, it's like, kind of like an ETF where the underlying asset they own are those Russian shares and ruble-denominated shares, but you can buy them in dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, everyone thinks that since those are frozen and they're not being traded, that Russia's stock exchange must be closed. And that's not the case. Uh, the, the Russian exchange is, is open. They've been doing business for probably a, a month and a half. And a lot of those shares have, have uh, you know, probably not uh, back to the level they were prior to the invasion, but they're, they're up at a pretty high level. But my point was uh, those ADRs are still frozen. So if the wet, and look at this, the, the West was willing to freeze the assets of another country's central bank. I mean, that, that doesn't sound like a big deal for people who don't know macro, but, but that's like nuclear war. I mean, th that is something that is totally, totally unprecedented. And so for the United States and the West to be willing to do that, I, I wouldn't put anything past them. Uh, and especially when you look at what Canada did to the truckers, you know, you want to talk about that on an individual level when they're just going around willy nilly, just freezing bank accounts and trying to dehumanize people that have even uh, made donations and trying to track them down and dox them and, you know, do all these things. You know, why wouldn't they uh, ban U.S. citizens or delist these Chinese companies as kind of a retaliation measure? And of course, the way they'll sell that as well, it's for your benefit. It's for your good. It's for your safety. For your safety. It's yeah. for your security. And uh, you know, you're too stupid, rich, to make your own decisions. So we'll just go ahead and make the decisions for you as to what you can and can't do with your money. 
And I think that's another thing that they'll probably use uh, to leverage this push towards disinformation and censorship, right? Where we have to uh, set up a central bank digital currency because we have to know every single transaction that Canadians and Americans are making to make sure that there's no one that's, that's funneling money to the enemy. We want to make sure that Rich Cooper isn't funneling money to, to Putin. Or we want to make sure that George Gammon isn't funneling money to Xi Jinping, you know. So in order to do that, uh, you know, they could do that. If we have cash, well, then they can do that. But if we ban cash and have a central bank digital currency, so all the transactions go through the central bank instead of Bank of America, then we can make sure that no one is funding our enemies and we can keep you safe and secure. I think that's kind of the, the way they'll sell it. Yeah, since you touched on central bank digital currencies, let's talk about that a little bit because I mean, the, like the trend that they've been on with uh, paper money, fiat money, whatever you just, you know you want to call it, and we've seen mass adoption of the blockchain. Not to the extent where like everybody has Bitcoin now, for example, which is obviously you know the most popular one, but it is still growing in popularity, and there's still a long way to go. Um, what do you think the effect of central bank digital currency is going to have on the economy in the coming years when they release it? And how far off do you think they are from imposing central bank digital currency on the population? I think we're one crisis away. So you go back. First of all, you have to understand these central bankers are, I think, are sociopaths, but they're also Keynesian. So they just look at everything through the lens of aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. So aggregate demand fixes everything. We can just, you know, so if it's stimmy checks, whatever we need to do to increase uh, aggregate demand. So you go back to uh, 2020 and they had a real issue increasing aggregate demand directly, i.e. getting dollars into the back pocket of the average Joe and Jane that can go out there and spend it. The only way they, they could do it was through sending stimmy checks and it wasn't uh, very efficient because it had to go through the mail and the IRS and all, all of these different uh, avenues where if they would have had a central bank digital currency, which means that every single citizen would have had an account at the Fed, then all the Fed would have had to do is just credit everyone's account $5,000 mm -hmm. and you're, you're done. It's a far more efficient way to get dollars into the real economy, uh, chasing goods and services. In other words, increasing aggregate demand. So I think that when uh, we do have another financial crisis, which is just a matter of when, not if, uh, they're going to come back in with uh, the same standard operating procedure. And that's that we need to do QE. We need to drop rates down to uh, back down to 0%. And we also need to come out with more stimulus, 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 stimulus. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to use a central bank digital currency. And the average Joe and Jane is going to say, huh? What is a central bank digital? And they're probably not even going to set it up that way, Rich. They're mm -hmm. probably just going to say, in order to get your STEMI check, what you need to do is just go to your phone and you need to download the Fed app. Mm -hmm. And then we'll give you your STEMI checks and you can just spend the, the new money just with the QR code or whatever it is mm -hmm. on your phone when you go to Starbucks or Walmart or Target or what have you. And uh, we'll give you a thousand Fed coins per month. And people aren't even going to ask, you know, there's free money. Sure. Oh, let me sorry. download the Fed app. And then what that does is that gives every single person an account with the Fed automatically, just like you now have an account with B of A or Wells Fargo. And it's going to gradually transition people off of using their local bank and using instead using the Fed. And then they're going to gradually or maybe suddenly try to wean people off of using cash. And once they've done that, then the central planners control the money supply. They control money. Therefore, like Kissinger said, uh, they control the world. You know, why is that? Well, right now, the majority of the money supply is created by the commercial banking system. So if you go and, and, and get a loan, let's say, for a new McLaren, uh, and they give you a $500,000 loan, that's money that didn't exist before. The, the, the bank, your local bank, just created that. They, they didn't take that from someone else to give to you. That's mm -hmm. a misconception. So that's brand new money. And let's say that the very next day the deal goes through and you're like, oh, that turned out to be a lemon. It was a salvage title, something like that. So you don't take the money. You just give it right back to the bank to pay off the entire principal. Well, then that decreases the money supply. 
by that five hundred thousand dollars all else being equal right so it's the commercial banks that really control the dollar and the way i usually say it is jerome powell doesn't control the dollar jamie Dimon does meaning the banksters do right but if you move to a central bank digital currency then jerome powell would have total control over the number of dollars that are circulating in the real economy uh, he would control the amount of dollars that are on the balance sheet of the non-bank entities therefore he would be able to control the rate of inflation he could just turn up the dial he could turn down the dial he could decrease increase the money supply he could increase velocity and even more frightening he could uh, issue credit to whomever has political favor because remember the commercial banks have a PL, therefore they're going to lend based on your ability to pay them back. The central bank doesn't have to do that because they don't have to worry about being paid back. So they can issue credit based on your social score. Uh, they can give you an interest rate that's better if you've been a good little boy and worn your mask. Uh, but if you get caught outside on camera, as an example, walking into a Walmart and you're not social distancing, well, that's going to be deducted from your credit score and the next time, or excuse me, your social score, and the next time you go to the bank to get a loan, you're going to have to pay you know, two percentage points higher or something like that. And that's if you even get approved for the loan. And then, of course, down here in the United States where they're so, oh, and, uh, Trudeau as well will really get on board with this, where they will extend credit to these groups that have political favor, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a straight white guy, forget it. You're not getting a loan or anything at any price <laughs> but no you'll get a preferred if, rate if you're right if you're but if you're some the, blue hair uh yeah. you know a liberal yeah, yeah, yeah. gal or whatever yeah. uh then you're gonna get uh, you know free money just showered upon you and uh, again they don't they can do that because they don't have to worry about being paid back or you know if you're someone that goes on twitter uh let's say or if you're a trucker well they can just completely excommunicate you from the entire banking system and if cash is banned and you don't have any purchasing power outside of the yeah. system, you're done. You're absolutely done. There's and also you the... can't take that that purchasing power and go down to Columbia yeah. because again, it's trapped within the banking system. And that goes back to that Kissinger quote. And it's coming guys. It's not like it's not gonna come. I mean, George just gave you a, a very simple way of how they're gonna force it on the uh, citizens of a country. And the part that he, that he didn't touch on was like the programmability of the money. So. If, so if you've got a climate crisis, for example, and you know, you've know you received your central bank digital currency and you wanna go get your groceries, but you've uh, extended your carbon credits for right. meat, let's say, at the checkout, when you try to check out with that steak, they may deny you the purchase of that and then hand you a bag of crickets or bugs instead, because that's what you've uh, been deemed to only be acceptable to eat at that point in time. And that might tie in your social credit. Maybe any number of ways that that comes. Yeah, but carbon it, credit score. Yeah. You know, MasterCard has already come out with a credit card that does that. In fact, this is on the World Economic Forum Forum's website. Mm. It's one of their corporate partners, the group that's doing this for MasterCard. And th this specific card tracks your your carbon score monthly based on what you buy. So if you buy more diesel fuel, if you buy more hamburger than you buy lettuce or something like that mm -hmm. it, it 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 tracks your your score there so to your point if you get to a certain level and the government deems that inappropriate then they just cut you off or you know another thing they do rich is if they want to increase velocity let's say bail out the, the government debt let's say the government's at 150 percent debt to gdp and they need to inflate their way out and they can't create the inflation they need like japan uh, to, and remember, inflation is just stealing purchasing power from the poor and middle class. Mm -hmm. What they can do is they say, okay, here your, here's your stimmy check or here's your Fed bucks for the month. Uh, now you've got to spend this within a week or else it disappears. And so people run out, spend it. That gets velocity increasing. That increases the rate of inflation, which, uh, again, lowers the debt burden for the federal government Although through the rate of inflation and since people's wages don't go up at the same rate, it decreases the purchasing power of the average Joe and Jane. And, you know, that's on a side note, that's one thing that we're seeing play out right in front of our eyes right now with the, uh, the society in the United States. We are getting far, far poorer 
uh, just almost every single month because you get inflation going up at, let's just say, 8% per year, and it's, it's a lot higher than the government would admit. But wages are only going up at 5%. So if wages are only going up at 5%, if real inflation is at 15, that's a 10% delta per year. And you compound that over five years, and that means people's uh, real wages are being decreased significantly, and the government is doing that intentionally to bail themselves out so they can pay back their debt with cheaper dollars. What is the hedge against that? Is it, is it Bitcoin? I think commodities are a great hedge against that. Again, I, I just keep beating this drum. But going back to what we we're saying, I think you have to, as with the World Economic Forum and whatnot, you have to have some sort of purchasing power outside the banking system. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the main reasons I like Bitcoin. I mean, long term, I'm pretty bullish. When it was up at 45, 50, 60, I, I was saying I'm definitely not adding to my position right now because I just saw hysteria mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, Bitcoin's going to a million. You know, the cab driver's talking about it. The, the, you know, the, uh, the shoe shine boy, you know, to talk about the 1920s with stocks, yeah. uh, they're talking about it. And I, I don't like to buy it. So I like to wait for panic. Mm -hmm. So it's come down quite a bit. Now I, I still would like to see a little more panic. I always tell people that my trigger to add to my position is when Michael Saylor has to sell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be the Apparently there's moment. no circumstance in which they would have to sell their Bitcoin is what he yeah, said. So he, he says that now we'll see. But, uh, but my, my point there is regardless of the price action of Bitcoin, I think you've got to own a little bit of it just to have that purchasing power outside of the banking system yeah. in case you become the next uh, tr or your group becomes the next set of truckers. Uh, I also love physical gold for mm -hmm. that reason. And another thing that's kind of uh, off most people's radars, that's fantastic purchasing power outside of the system, uh, are Rolex watches. Yeah. And uh, if really you can get well. a good Rolex, you know, James Cameron, or, you know, if you can get the, the all gold Submariner, I mean, that's 40 grand of purchasing power that you can just slap on your wrist in a moment's notice and get on a flight to Argentina or something. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, let's say five of those in your bag, got a couple hundred grand in purchasing power that gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of freedom and a lot of purchasing power outside of the whole klaus uh, trudeau biden central bank system that uh, i think they're trying to create cool all right well let's let's clean up these uh super chats and then we'll wrap uh, wrap up so we've sure. got uh bredo says our 40-year mortgage is coming what will all that mean I don't know if 40-year mortgages are coming, but I think they will try to come up with schemes to prop up the housing market if it goes down in nominal terms. So right now, the game the Fed is playing is they're trying to bring down the CPI or headline CPI without increasing rates. So they sit there and talk tough like Paul Volcker, but at the end of the day, they've only increased rates to 75 basis points. And that's, that, that's nothing because they know that they can't take rates to 2%, 3% without completely crushing the economy because the debt is so high, the sovereign debt, the, the corporate debt, and the, com and the uh, consumer debt. So they're trying to talk down asset prices like the stock market, like the housing market to bring down CPI. So my point here is that the United States and, and most people in general, for some reason, there's this big disconnect between asset prices and consumer prices. So they like uh, asset inflation, but they hate consumer price inflation <laughs> as though if they're not as though they're not connected somehow, right? Mm -hmm. So my point is even if we have high higher CPI, I think they'll still try to prop up the market if uh, uh, nominal prices start to slide. 40 year mortgages could be a way they do that. Another thing that they're proposing in Australia right now is the government just buying a 40% equity position in your house. I don't know if you heard about that, Rich, but no, that's new. So, yeah, so if you can't afford the high prices of a house, well, instead of adding supply and letting the free market work, the government is saying, we'll buy 40% of your house right when you buy it. So we'll take a 40% equity position, and then you'll only have to make the monthly payments on 60%. And they say when, when housing prices go up and you decide to sell, then you can just, when you, you know, at the sale point, the title company, you can just pay off the government their 40% position. The government will make money you'll make money and you have these super, super low monthly payments. What they don't tell you is if prices go down, 
you you know your equity position gets wiped out immediately if you can't make those mortgage payments especially yeah. because down there all the uh, loans are adjustable rate so if rates go up then who does that house go back to it goes right back to the government and the, uh, then they own all the housing stock all the sneaky ways the government tries to move itself into your life it's just it, it, yeah. it's just never ending like I don't yeah, it's like Reagan's quote, or was it Reagan or Milton Friedman that said, you know, the, the, the scariest, I'm paraphrasing, but they said the scariest thing can, that can happen to you is when the government shows up at your front door and says, we're here to help. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're basically saying that we've, you, you know, we've become a partner in your, in your family wealth. If you're going to take a 40% position in your business, I mean, you know, I was just about to say, like, I don't swear that often to my cast, but the government could just fuck right off when it comes to getting yeah. involved in our lives. If, Agreed. Is the way that I see it. Agreed. Um, Ernesto says, international stuff is making waves, of course, but are the economical effects of the aging boomer generations worth considering moving forward? For example, sales of their home stocks, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great co cross current that uh, Ernesto is talking about. And we have to understand that with inflation, deflation, stocks going up or down, housing prices going up or down, there's always uh, forces on both sides, right? There's tailwinds for the housing market. There's headwinds for the housing market. One of the main headwinds is the, the demographics that he's referring to. Now, uh, a tailwind that might counter that would be the government coming in and doing one of these programs or just universal basic income. Mm -hmm. you know, sure, you've got a demographic problem, but if you don't want deflation, we'll just send everybody $2,000 a month and, and make them spend it within two weeks. And uh, you're going to have a lot of inflation, even though you've got uh, the baby boomers retiring, right? So uh, there, there's ways around that. And I think the government has looked at Japan over the last 20 years in, this, in the central banks and said to themselves, okay, what did they do wrong? Why could they not create inflation? And when you look at it, it's pretty obvious what they did wrong. And now they have the technology to make sure that doesn't happen again, especially if we have a central bank digital currency. Okay, and we got. Uh, you don't think Shanghai is in? Sorry, yeah. is intentional to slow economic growth or the largest yeah. importer of the yeah. U.S. I think that's another thing that could be going on there. It's a great point. Is if you want to basically uh, have a subtle weapon against the United States and pretty much the global economy, just shut down Shanghai and shut down the port there. Uh, when China supplies so many of the goods that we use uh, in the global economy. Uh, it, it could be just, you know, they're sending a shot across the bow to all these other um, uh, domestic economies like the United States and the UK and the Eurozone, Australia saying, hey, this is the power that we have. This is what we can do to your local in, uh, to, to local inflation in your area. And this is a big message to the politicians because they know that that is political kryptonite. The, the fastest thing you can do to not get reelected is have consumer prices increase, have the price of gas go from $3 a gallon to $5. Uh, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, you're not going to vote for that guy or that gal. So this could be China's way of doing that. Uh, it, it could be China's way of conditioning their society to be prepared for life with fewer resources if they have to go to war. Uh, it also could be a way of China just saving face, right? Because they've got to manage 100, uh, 1.5 billion people and they have this authoritarian approach and they can't show weakness. So if you put all your eggs into the lockdown basket, if you have further spikes in the cerveza sickness, you have to go back to locking down. You can't admit that you were, or you can't not do it because then you were admitting that you were wrong to begin with. And then if the 1.5 billion people, if they see Superman bleed, then all of a sudden, maybe maybe he's human. And you start seeing a lot of the protest, a lot of civil unrest. So that could be another component of their strategy as well. Is they're just trying to save face so they can continue to take this authoritarian approach with the population. Uh, next one is, George, do you think the Americans, Canadian relocating to locations with lower cost of living like Colombia is a wise move considering the upcoming ec economic collapse, rising inflation and increased cost of living? I do. I mean, that's what I'm doing in my own personal life. So I'm in Miami right now. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't like spending a lot of time here because I know Russia has nuclear subs that 
are superior to our technology probably 20 miles off the coast uh, the u.s can't see <laughs> and mm -hmm. i i you know although that's a very very low probability i wouldn't lose sleep over it um i, I don't like being in the line of fire so to speak and another thing i'm very concerned with in the united states uh, is uh food shortages so that's why i like to spend time in colombia medellin where you've got all the food that's grown within probably five square miles of the city uh where you're not in the, the firing line between potentially the united states and and russia and you can just sit back uh, from a distance enjoy fantastic weather fantastic food fantastic people uh, women maybe more specifically <laughs> and uh just a great cost of living and enjoy life and uh it allows me i think to be in a better state of mind where i can be more productive as well um just a shout out uh jumped jumped in on luke what's luke luke oil okay uh, okay, and follow up to that. I was told once they'd never get rid of cash. Politicians like bribes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good point there. Yeah, there's, a, again, there are a lot of different cross currents at play. <laughs> Remember, there's rules for different uh, set of, uh, you know, like the elites, right? So Yeah, the rules are for thee and not for, for me. me. Yeah. Uh, Repil Korea, any advice for Asian South Korean who wants to invest with dollars? Well, again, I, I'd look at commodities. I'd set up an IB account with interactive brokers, and I'd look at some of those coal companies. Uh, I'd look at the Sprott uh, Uranium Trust. I would look at, uh, let's see, dollar. I mean, if you want dry powder, you're probably best to go into T-bills just short-term and roll them over. Hmm. Um, and then maybe wait for dollar assets to get cheaper, uh, like the stock market, if we have a recession. Um, that, that's probably what I would, I mean, that's what I'm doing in my own portfolio is I have a much, 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 uh, larger cash position than I usually have. Uh, I still have some real estate still have hard assets and whatnot, but there's a large portion of my portfolio that's just straight cash. And I, I although I'm losing purchasing power to the stuff that I can buy in the United States, I think that I'm going to be gaining purchasing power. It's kind of placing a bet that we go through a recession in the next 18 months mm -hmm. and stock prices go down to a point where there's panic in the market and I can get them on the cheap. Got it. Okay. And then these will be the last two. So no more super chats guys. Uh, Bredo says, how long can they still prop up the housing until the crash? Can they prevent such a crash indefinitely with the programs you mentioned? Uh, not indefinitely because at some point in time, there's, there's no free lunch. You got to pay the fiddler. But if you look at Canada, if you look at all the crazy programs they've come out with in Australia, I mean, I don't see why the United States can't do the exact same thing. And especially if the Fed starts issuing debt right and now. mortgages, uh, you know, on their balance sheet where they don't have to worry about being paid back. I, I definitely think they've got more uh, tools in, in the central bank bag to try to prop up the, the housing market. Will it work? I don't know. We'll have to see. All right. And then the last one before we wrap up, Tim says, just sold my home and bought 50 acres of land in the country. Nice. I have 130,000 in the bank and was planning to use that plus 200 K mortgage to build a home. Would you recommend holding off the building and shop house, sorry, building a shop slash house cash debt free? Yeah. It depends on how secure your income is. So if you've got a super steady source of income, that's re recession proof uh, and you're positive that you can make that mortgage payment, uh, it might make sense. But the thing I, I where I hesitate there is uh, you could get stuck if your income gets put on hold. Now you've got this mortgage payment and you're buying a property that doesn't necessarily cash flow. Uh, if your property, ca like if you had an Airbnb or a bed and breakfast on the property, I would like that a lot more because then you're paying off the mortgage with other people's money, meaning that cash flow that's being produced by the asset itself. So I would prefer that, but I'm not going to tell you not to do it because it's a great plan B. It just depends on how secure your income stream is. Awesome. Uh, George, it's been a absolute pleasure and slice to have this conversation with you to let you red pill my audience on some uh, <laughs> ideas around money and the economy and what you see going on. If you guys like George's take on things, um, go and subscribe to his YouTube channel, George Gammon, and his other YouTube channel, Rebel Capitalist. Uh, this is all he talks about. He also holds uh, events, uh, 
in real life events. So, you know, you can check those out as well. Yeah, Anything Rebel else? Capitalist Live is the next one. It's it's Miami, June 24th through the 26th. And we got Doug Casey. We got Kiyosaki is going to be there. Uh, on, Jeff Snyder, Brent Johnson. Uh, it's going to be a blast. So you guys can check it out at rebelcapitalistlive.com. Anything else you wanted to shout out to before we wrap up? No, that's it. I appreciate you having me on, Rich. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I can't wait to get you down to one of my events or a mastermind group and say hello face-to-face, -face, grab a beer and talk cars. We'll do it, brother. We'll do it soon. Thanks. And a guy, and again, and again, guys, give that uh, thumbs up a quick hit and uh, thanks for watching today.